Testing? All right. Hello and welcome everyone to the final Coalesce, one of the final Coalesce sessions of the day. Uh, my name is Andrew Tom and I'm a senior data analyst at DBT Labs, also your MC for this session. Um, today I'm wearing this orange hat, but as you all know, it's not uncommon for data professionals at many companies to wear many hats, and which is exactly what we're going to be hearing about today. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the title of this talk is called Excel at Nothing, How to Be an Effective Generalist. And I'm joined on, joined on stage by Stephen Bailey, who is a data engineer at Whatnot. Um, he holds a PhD in cognitive neuroscience, is that right? Uh, yep. Yep. Um, and he has three kids. Um, so we're delighted to have him. Before we begin, though, some quick housekeeping. Uh, the conversation and QA for this talk will be on the Slack channel Coalesce Excel at Nothing. So please, uh, over the course of the presentation, as questions bubble up, feel free to drop them in and our Slack monitors will pin them so that Stephen can answer them later. Uh, and last but not least, um, afterwards, Stephen will hang out for a little bit, but don't be alarmed if uh, he doesn't reply to questions right away. He will stick around and eventually hit all the questions on Slack. Uh, Without further ado, let's get started. Over awesome. to you. Thank you. So before I get started, I just want everyone to acknowledge that you looked at the title, Excel at Nothing, and were like, that's the talk for me right now. <laughs> so I give you license. I'll just do it right away. I give you license to be as mediocre as you want in your career. Um, that's not what this talk is going to aim for, but uh, if that's the takeaway you need, like, you got it. So my name is Stephen Bailey. I'm a data engineer at Whatnot. Whatnot is kind of like uh, eBay meets Twitch. It's a live stream shopping app. It's been a lot of fun. It's a, kind of a roster of, a, of a, uh, two years since it was uh, founded. And I've only been a data engineer for a couple months, actually. Um, I've been a data scientist, analyst, director of data, um, and even a real scientist at, at one point. What having all of these titles has taught me is that I don't trust titles anymore. Um, <laughs> instead, what I've found is that I really like a certain type of work. And that type of work is what I will call in this conversation uh, generalist work. And I had that light bulb moment last year when Anna Filipova uh, published this We the Purple People blog on DBT Labs blog. It's a great article, I uh, encourage you to read it, but basically she outlines a type of work that bridges technical, uh, technical skills with business knowledge and unlocks new value for the business through kind of a, the combination of the blue technical and the red um, business knowledge, which creates like a purple, purple work. I really like this analogy, but I was also trained as a scientist formally. And what they teach you at science school is that when you like an idea, you kind of declare to the world, hey, this is a great idea, but it's wrong and I can do it better. And so that's what this talk is. This is really taking uh, this idea of purple people and purple work and trying to expand it into something that's a little more general, but also that highlights the, the types of problems and challenges that are intrinsic to purple or generalist work, and then also the types of possibilities that are available to people who pursue this type of work. So we're going to talk a little bit about theory, we're going to talk about perils, and we're going to talk about possibilities. So I have a little bit of an audience participation uh, exercise for all of us, uh, just to kick things off. I'm going to read this sentence, and when I get to this blank, I want everyone to say the first thing that comes to their mind out loud in real life. All right. The opposite of a, gen of a generalist is a specialist. Perfect. Unanimity across uh, the entire audience, and hopefully online, too. Um, the opposite of a generalist is a specialist. And what I want to get clear right off the bat is that these two concepts are not connected by some one special specialness axis that specialists are more special. I think everyone in this room is very, very special. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, you are very special. Instead, the difference between these two roles is that the generalist tends to have a higher breadth, while the specialist tends to have a deeper 
uh, exercised impact in a certain domain. So it's really this breadth versus depth two axis dichotomy. And I have a Pareto front on this graph, which indicates that there's a trade off here. In, in a given time, there's a constraint. You can only, you can either go very deep in one thing or you can uh, exercise uh, a wider breadth. But typically, you can't go, you know, both very deep and very wide at the same time. Uh, what I want to point out here is that both in the purple person definition and in our typical way we use generalists and specialists, we often focus on the technical aspects of it. But what I'm going to argue in this talk is that the technical aspects are almost the least interesting things to focus on. And the reason I think that is because I worked in a very, very special place for a while. And that place was academia, where everyone truly is a very special. But they are also very smart. And so you are kind of controlling for um, smartness and skill. Everyone has some, something that makes them excellent at what they do. But what you find is that even within academia, even within the scientific community, there are different types of work. The program that I in, uh, enrolled in, which I was totally unqualified for, by the way, uh, was a program called Educational Neuroscience. And the way it was often described is as this big three-circle Venn diagram. And just a pro tip, if you ever see a three-circle Venn diagram, that is a clue you are in generalist territory. And you should expect a lot of ambiguity and confusion. Um, so as I bumbled my way through this, uh, through this PhD program, I initially thought, like, all right, I'm going to be at the center of education, biology, psychology. I'm going to be right in that, that middle point, And it's going to be awesome. I'm going to learn everything that's there. But what I found out as I went through was, first of all, these three circles were not all there was. I had to learn a bunch of other stuff that they didn't tell me about. And it took me a long time to learn. And it was kind of a bummer. But it gave me a skill set, which we're not going to talk about. Instead, as I went through, after about two years, what I realized is that there is no center to this Venn diagram. There is actually a bunch of smaller communities that sort of comprise these larger entities of education or biology, psychology. They're really only related because budgets in universities have line items for these different, different things. They have roles. It's almost an, a totally artificial construct. And instead, at the edges of the scientific community, you found individuals who were working together. And that is what gave rise to any, any sort of organizational principles that you could put on top of the scientific community. And so what I took out of this experience was that first, organizations, every organization of people comprise smaller communities. These communities emerge from relationships and then these relationships are actually individuals working together. So you can't disentangle the way that people work together from the organization and the larger concept. So organizations are made of individuals working together. And why that, why that matters is because if you look at a set of people, say like here's a, a set of people where each dot represents one person and each uh, edge represents them working together, you can see that there's really two types of uh, work that people can do. They can work within a, a community and have influence within that smaller community, or they can do work that goes between communities. And so what I want to argue in this talk is that the specialist mostly operates within communities and that the generalist operates between communities. And that's the defining nature of generalist work. It has nothing to do with technical skills, although technical skills are often important. It has everything to do with connecting communities of people. And so if we look back at this chart, we see organize, and we think of it in terms of organizational generalism, what you'd say is a generalist is someone who works between a lot of communities and br like brokers information between them, whereas a specialist who is someone who works within a community and pushes that community forward or plays an important role within that one community. And so if you map some roles, you know, just as examples onto this chart, you can see like IT support works with a lot of stakeholders across the organization, but has very little leverage in any of those. Whereas a system admin, say a Salesforce admin, works really within one system, but has quite a bit of power on how things are done within that community. The founder and CEO are the ones who really are the exceptions that prove the rule that, you, um, that it's very unusual to have someone who has broad leverage and broad impact. Um, and then of course, interns are down here on the bottom left. Um, so why are we talking about this here? Um, this is kind of like a general framework. Uh, doesn't seem 
you know, maybe very tactical for most of us. Well, I'm going to argue that data work is fundamentally leans toward generalist work. Not only does it attract a lot of people who are generalists, the actual thing towards as data practitioners often tend to be at the uh, between community interfaces. If you look at the stuff we argue about, like data team structure, it's the centralized versus embedded uh, organized org chart. If you look at Kimball's data warehouse model, uh, it's how do we take data from community A and create interfaces for communities B, C, and D. If you look at hub and spoke models, it's literally creating interfaces uh, that allow for efficient transfer across the organization. If you look at data, Um, data should be connecting distinct com uh, communities of people in the organization. Okay. So that's the theory. Uh, let's get a little more tactical. So let's say you might be saying, all right, I, this sounds awesome. I want to work. Give me all the communities. I'm going to be, a, you know, I want to be a part of them. Uh, this sounds great. That's how I was when I first started this work. And I was surprised at how challenging it was. There were obvious challenges, like I know I'm going to have to learn a bunch of stuff. I know I'm going to have to meet a bunch of people and work with a bunch of different stakeholders. That seems obvious, like if you're going to work with a bunch of different communities. But there were some, uh, some surprises along the ways uh, that, that led me to burn out for a while. And so I want to talk specifically about what sorts of challenges someone who's going to be a generalist is going to face and how they might prevent burnout. To do this, I want to I look at like how a purple project typically gets enacted. So let's say here, as an example, we have engineering and an engineering organization and a marketing organization. Let's say marketing wants to get an event from the engineering organization and send emails off of it. Seems like a pretty simple use case, but there's no, there's no interaction right now between those two communities, really. There's no established relationship. What a purple person is going to do is they're going to identify the gap. There's an opportunity here. They're going to come in, they're going to make friends, build relationships, they're going to assemble a solution, and then they're going to get out of there. Because that isn't, because sticking between these two communities is not what a generalist has signed up for. They want to do it for a while, and then they want to get out. So what could go wrong here? If we don't know anything about the situation, there's, there's some structural problems that we know the purple person is going to face. First, they're going to be lonely. I mean, look at all the blue people here. They're like, they have all these blue friends. They probably go to blue bowling parties. This purple person has no home here. They're going to be misunderstood. They're acting as an interface between community A and community B. So when they bring blue information to the orange team, the purple person is going to be the one who's like misunderstood. Maybe if the purple person has a, a set of like established best practices that are purple best practices, like Snowflake, DBT, Fivetran, they're going to bring them in here. But the blue people and the orange people, they don't speak that language. So this purple person is automatically going to face challenges about being understood. And then if they, even if they successfully implement a solution, it's very possible that they get stuck as the, the perpetual maintainer of that solution, um, and they can't get out. All of these things are, they are not technical problems. They're problems intrinsic to the nature of trying to build a relationship between two communities. And I want to talk about how, like, and so they're going to happen. And generalists should come in. They should be prepared for them to happen, to feel these things. But what you want to prevent is you want to prevent burnout, and you want to prevent these problems from torpedoing the actual project. And so that's what I want to talk about, the failure modes for each of these, and then ways to mitigate it. So first of all, if you don't have a home, you're going to feel lonely. But the problem to the project of not having a home is that you don't design a solution that is acceptable to either community. There's this famous um, you know, tale of King Solomon where the two, two women come up and they have a baby and they say they both are arguing about who's the mother and the solution is to split the baby in half. And of course doing that reveals who the, uh, threatening to do that reveals who the true owner is. And the same is true for purple problems where there is probably some globally optimal solution that could be implemented. It doesn't fully satisfy either community. You're probably not going to get it adopted. And the project might fail. If not immediately, then over time. So the solution here is to, when you come into a, uh, a project, 
find a key stakeholder in one of the communities and make tailor the solution to their needs. Make it work really well for them and simply satisfy the other uh, stakeholder. In the Inge marketing example, um, you probably would want to come in and optimize it for marketing because they're going to want to send a bunch of different emails. You want to make sure everyone understands the solution on their end and just make something that is, uh, the engineers can deal with because they're not going to be excited about sending emails. Just make sure it, make it work on that end. And that will also help you feel successful and more part of one of those communities as you go through that project. Second problem is that you can't get a job option. Um, this is frequently the case. I've had this happen time and again when I've come in and I've said, oh yeah, this looks like an integration into Snowflake and then we'll just build some DBT models on top and we'll create a Looker Explorer and then you'll have a dashboard. And the stakeholders kind of say, okay, that sounds good. But then they don't understand what's happening. No deeper understanding of what's happening and the project fails to get adoption long term because there's got this cognitive barrier of a bunch of stuff happening in a box that they don't understand fully. And so they never take full ownership of it. The mitigation in this case um, is oftentimes just to innovate as little as possible. There's a great article about having three innovation tokens uh, per year, where you can choose to introduce a new system or introduce some new way of doing things, but you can only do it a couple of times, because each time you introduce a new system, that has a cost associated with it. It's cognitive cost, it's new maintenance cost. And the same is, and that's, really important to keep in mind as you're doing purple work because you're trying, you're introducing a system into other people's workflows. So if you can do something with a, a new list view in Salesforce, rather than extracting data and adding a reverse ETL tool, use the list view and then do the other stuff, the more fancy stuff later. Solve problem one before you solve problem two, three, and four. And then the final uh, issue, the final challenge is that if you are very successful, oftentimes you create a, a bridge between two teams, but then there's a lot of maintenance work as more stuff gets put on that bridge, more, more things happen. And that can be very good. A lot of people um, really enjoy going in and digging and taking ownership over a certain area. They enjoy like starting out as a, a generalist and then actually becoming a specialist and building out um, you know, a certain system. But if you don't wanna do that, or if there's a, a, a piece of work that, or a system that you really want to make sure that the community owns, then you need to identify that really early in the process and signal it again and again and again and again. What I've done, started doing is every meeting, like every, if I have weekly meetings for a project, I will say, hey, it's a top priority of mine to make sure you guys understand this whole system because I'm gonna be gone at the end. And I say it again and again and again and again, so that when I, at the end of that project, I can feel comfortable that I've messaged um, the need for them to own and understand it while I'm on that project. And then if it burns at the end, it's not a testament on me or on them, it's just a testament that that thing didn't, um, didn't yield enough value. And that's okay. Generalists should be okay with letting things burn. <laughs> The right things, the right things. Um, and so all three of these recommendations, they really come down to a mindset shift when you're approaching generalist work. Um, if you come in and you think like, I'm the data person and I'm, I do data things like DBT, I'm gonna build the best model to solve this problem, then what you're gonna miss is you're gonna miss the context that you're working in. Remember the primary focus is establishing a relationship between two communities. The, it's not to, bring your sort of like uh, your data platform or your solutions and implement it. Um, and that's what generalists need to, to come into purple problems uh, focused on. Stay open, focus on that empty area and filling it and locally optimizing it. And that'll help you avoid burnout. So now I wanna move into the possibilities that generalist work has. And to do that I need to introduce just a little bit more theory um, and that is that organization structures constrain individual relationships. So we, have, we can physically, or we can create structures that guide organizations to, uh, to that guide people to work in a certain way. We can foster communities um, intentionally. And the most obvious example of this is a role hierarchy. So if we take a, uh, you know, a, a small organization, say it starts as a four person startup, there's a CEO and three other folks, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows. 
What you have after a year or so is, is an organization with several levels. Um, this is great. The, you can see that the communities are much denser. There's much more information. There's probably much more stuff happening, um, hopefully in a way that's, that's productive for the business. But you can also see that there's some challenges. If information needs to flow uh, between one person at the bottom of this hierarchy and another on the, on the other side, you have to go through a lot of organizational structures to get there. Or if they want to start a collaboration directly, you have to go through a lot more, you have to go a lot further distance to do that. This is what's known as a structural whole. And the, or the, um, the article that first introduced the concept, as far as I know, came out in 2004, and they did this big study on, on big organizations and basically found that people who straddle holes uh, have more successful projects, have a more quantity of successful projects, they have higher compensation, and they end up going further in the organization. And the hypothesis that they propose is that when you straddle different communities, rather than just being in one, you are at higher risk of having a good idea. And I, I, love, that, I love that language. <laughs> but you are more likely to have an idea and to test something out that is going to take you further and take the organization further if you're straddling these communities. And so if we take that organizational hierarchy splay it out and think about it from an overhead perspective. It might look something like this, where you can see these distinct communities, you can see they're connected through the uh, sort of the hierarchy of the org chart. And you look at it, you can see many structural holes that exist. So of course we have the marketing and engineering one we had before, but you can see each of these communities has structural holes with the other communities. And that makes collaboration very hard. Now say you added a data team in here that had four people, with only four people, versus, I don't know, the 45 or 50 that are on here, what, you've, what happens is that the structure of the graph, it becomes much easier for people across the organization to collaborate, um, just from an information flow perspective. So instead of taking you know, 10 steps or 12 steps for, for someone in engineering to work with someone in marketing, it's, it's like two or three hops through this sort of information highway or collaboration highway, however you want to describe it. Um, so what data teams do, what generalists do, is they allow for farther reaching collaborations within an organization um, that exists outside the hierarchy of roles. And so I wanna talk about three examples of this that I think are just conspicuous examples of structural holes that data teams tend to fill. And especially like, it, it, it kinda has a past, present, and future uh, theme here of filling communication gaps, filling trust gaps, and filling compliance gaps. So metrics are one of the sort of premier things that data teams do. If you look across all of, our, all of the organizations, it's probably the only thing that unites all of us is that at some point we're creating metrics and giving them to people. But what metrics actually do from an organizational perspective is they make it very, very easy for executives to talk to people in the weeds and get information about how things are going. If I give, I can say in eight words com and communicate a whole lot to you, if I say, Product, green. In sales, green. Marketing, green. HR, red. Everyone in this room, if we have a 15-minute meeting, we know what we want to talk about. We want to talk about HR and why it's red. That's the role that metrics fill. It's, it's an a efficient communication um, interface. Contracts, which are so hot right now, um, they fill trust gaps. That's what they're really there for. The, the whole is that community B wants to use community A's information for some reason, but there's no established relationship there. If the organization was pretty small, they probably could just walk over and say, hey, can you send this event? And like, this is what it should look like? That'd be fine. But when the organization grows, there's a structural hole. There's no accountability for uh, enforcing trust between these two communities. And that's where contracts step in, contract schemas, um, they step in. They create a shared interface that's understandable and actionable for both communities. And long term, they probably don't need a generalist to maintain them, but in the short term, often they do need a generalist to come in, understand the needs from everybody, set that system up, and then provide occasional maintenance. And one, one area that I think is going to become more and more common for data teams to deal with is um, compliance and privacy controls. Um, I know we're focusing a lot on this at Whatnot, and it, it sort of rolls down to the data team because the data team integrates information from across the organization. We may not like it, but that's sort of the reality. 
And the, the gap here is actually not within the organization, it's actually with external communities. So if you think of the, the whole organization as one big community and then regulatory agencies, different nations as other communities, that's the interface or that's the hole that's actually being filled when we implement compliance and metadata tooling around privacy controls, et cetera. Um, and so the impact of that is going gonna, is gonna to be proportional with how much you care about complying with the law, but the fact remains that it's generalist work because you're bridging communities um, that don't have established relationships with each other. So to put a point on it, to flourish as a generalist, to really hit, um, hit projects that are going to make have transformational impact, what you want to focus on is, is filling structural holes that have high impact for the organization, things like metrics, things like uh, setting up trusted interfaces. These high leverage problems are places where there's no clear ownership, and it's also where you're really likely to get insights about the organization that you wouldn't if you were just nested within a single community. By focusing on these areas, you improve your chances of having a good idea and making uh, sort of an outsized impact. And I want to end with one observation, um, one observation I had during my PhD and that surprised me, and that was that even in the scientific community where everyone is very smart and even the, the most brilliant professors who go on to have incredible careers, as they grow in their career and in their impact, they actually do less of the technical work. Instead, what they start doing is they start directing the work of the community that they are a part of and then the communities that are adjacent to them to the broader needs of the scientific community. So as you get deeper and look for more impact, you become more of a generalist. You get out of the weeds of a specific problem and you start looking for connections across disciplines and domains and finding trends that can help direct the entire community in a fruitful direction. And actually you see this exactly in the organization charts that we have today. Executives who are at the top of the hierarchy, if you take them out of the picture, what happens? You have a whole in the organization. And so generalists sort of are, are core to any organization. If you're interested in that sort of work, I fully encourage you to do it. Be prepared for the challenges, but also be prepared to have a lot of impact. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for an awesome presentation. Uh, and thank you all for attending uh, day two of Coalesce. We'll catch you in day three. For those of us uh, in the room, just a reminder to also drop your questions on the Coalesce Excel at Nothing DBT Slack channel. Um, and Stephen will get to those questions uh, in a little bit. But otherwise, please uh, enjoy yourselves. And for those of us who are in person here, uh, a reminder that we will be gathering in the Celestine foyer, which is just outside of where the keynote was this morning to gather for our uh, kickoff party tonight. Thank you.